Trish holds an MFA from California College of Arts and Crafts, uh, which she received in 2003. And she continues her interactive, interruptive, interventionist art practice here in San Diego, where she has served as the archive curator, which we just uh, saw an example of that work, and uh, the current uh, gallery at CalIT2 PI, as well as a composer and residence production coordinator for the Qualcomm Institute, where we are now. And special thanks to the Qualcomm Institute for hosting the gallery and this event. Uh, Trish teaches media classes and ICAM classes in the visual arts department, currently teaching a class in media sketchbook uh, during the winter quarter 2018, and uh, does so as a lecturer here at UCSD. So with that, I'm going to introduce Trish. She's going to say a few words, and then we'll have a panel discussion about the work and take some questions from all of you. Let's welcome Trish Stone. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I'm ha very happy to be here and um, getting to present some work to you all today. And um, I wanted to uh, make sure to thank the gallery committee. Um, the show first came about uh, last year when Professor uh, Ricardo Dominguez asked me to submit a proposal to the gallery for a show. And um, the timing happened to be such that we had just um, had an election, and uh, lots of people like myself were upset at how things turned out. And um, like many of us, I was particularly feeling like completely powerless to do anything about it, and uh, doubly so as an artist. Uh, I thought, well, what, what difference could one person possibly make? And I thought, well, maybe if there were more of me, <laughs> we could do something. Uh, and so began um, about a year's worth of exploring different ways of replicating and um, figuring out how to enliven these little figurines, which um, you'll see in the gallery. Um, so along the way, I had uh, a lot of help from a lot of people. And uh, some of that came from the prototyping lab, which is here in Cal IT2. And I'm sorry, is it possible just to dim this light a little bit? Um, it's just kind of in the eyes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so the prototyping lab is right across the hall from the gallery at Cal IT2. And uh, they were very, very sweet. Um, the engineers that work there are led by Frank Cardone. And uh, his student, Justin Berger, uh, basically volunteered to do an enormous amount of 3D printing if I could get them the files. And so um, we did a scan with a 3D Sense uh, scanner, just a handheld scanner. It actually took several scans to get one that would work. Um, so we did one um, who could kind of raise her hand in protest and hold a sign <laughs> and another one um, who's just kind of an ally and stands there with her hands in her pockets and doesn't do much but helps emotional support. <laughs> so uh, we got those figurines, and um, they are actually now in the gallery, and there's a little webcam on them. Let's see if this is going to work. Just testing our, testing our tech here a little bit. So... There's a little webcam uh, from the gallery showing the figurines. They're protesting 24-7. So it's OK if you need like a little downtime, because they will be protesting for you. And they are always protesting, and they're always angry. And um, they're always doing something about it. So that's their role. Um, and the idea there is, since I, I have a few more on the way, is that they can also adjust what it is they're protesting about. So maybe one day it's the election, and um, you know, next month I'm sure there will be another hot topic. Um, so this can change and evolve as, as the months go on. The show will be up through mid-March, uh, so for the winter quarter. Uh, so um, back to the actual production. Um, 
a lot of, of what you'll see on view in the gallery are photographs. Uh, so these I would put in the hallway. Here we go. There's a picture, photograph of a photograph. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of these are of the figurines uh, themselves. And um, since they're miniatures, I, I had fun trying to position them so that they might look full scale and as if they're actually protesting whatever is behind them. So here they're protesting um, the gentrification of North Park. And up here, uh, they're sort of walking along in a parade. Um, and as you take a look at this show, you'll recognize uh, different institutions that they're protesting. There's a, there's a couple banks. Uh, one of them is the local Chase, and another is a local Bank of America. Um, but there's, there's lots of sites. And the, the idea for the project was to do um, protest in public and look at different gestures of protest as something that uh, we can all explore. And then the third element of the show is the game, uh, which is working and has lovely music, uh, which was um, happily collected from Michael Trujillo. And uh, the game is really meant to be played by visitors who come and gives them a sense that they can interact uh, with the landscape. Uh, so uh, this was all made in Unity, and it was really a result of what I was teaching last quarter in the virtual environments class. Um, so we built it all in Unity and then set it up so that it could bl be played as an interactive game. And anyone is welcome to do that, and there's just a few clicks and you can enjoy it. It's fun. So I thought I might share with you this one little reading, which I really was inspired by last quarter. Um, this is a 1991 article by Michael Heim. Let's see if I can get it big enough here to share with you. I think we should go full screen. Oh, that would be lovely. You up at the top bar. OK, there we go. Just so I can read it here. Um, so. So, you know, take for granted, this was 1991. Um, but it's a nice little piece of reading that kind of resonated with me. Uh, so he says, uh, the commission money was good, and the artist arrived on time. One of the executives from corporate design was there to meet her at the door. After touring the facilities, the artist was left alone to begin painting. Each day, the mural materialized a bit more, section by section spreading a ribbon of color across the large gray wall at the end of the lobby. First, a green patch of forest glade appeared, two blossoming plum trees, three sky blue vistas, and a Cheshire cat on a, a branch. Finally, the day came when the tarp would fall. Employees gathered around plastic cups and croissants. When the speeches were over, the room grew hushed for the unveiling. The crowd gasped. The wall came alive with paradise, an intricate world of multicolored shapes. Several employees lingered to chat with the artist. Once the congratulations died down, the artist strolled to the center of the mural, stopping where the garden path leads into the forest. And with face to the crowd, she smiled, bowed, and turned her back. Walking into the green leaves, she was never seen again. <laughs> So the thought there is, is just that it's possible to create a piece of artwork that you can disappear into and becomes more real than reality itself, which is a, a wonderful thing to aspire to, and, uh, which I try to help my students to get to also. Uh, so I think that that is a good time to pause, and we'll have a little discussion up here at the panel. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask, and we'll, we'll do our best to field them. Pinar, are you? Oh, so I should also introduce Pinar. Uh, so she has uh, recently joined us at UCSD as visual arts faculty member. And uh, many of you may remember from the show she had here at the gallery last year. 
and um, she's also joined our gallery committee, so is doing double duty here tonight. We're happy to have you. So, can you guys hear me? Great. Um, welcome, Pinar. Hi, Trish. The, uh, I, I just want to, I have a couple of questions, and I thought we could just have a conversation about what you just told us, Trish, and what Pinar and I saw in the show, and then obviously open it up for lots of questions that may arise um, here and there. One of the things that I think is interesting about Trish's work and in the work that I mentioned in the introduction, the project Things I Never Say from 2011 or 2012, um, in that project, uh, you had made a lot of, taken a lot of statements that were things you would never say and then sort of performed them in public, sort of took them out into the world and, re and kind of restaged them in front of public webcams. And in this piece that you've made now, you've done this kind of, kind of continued in some ways this idea of private feelings in in public but whereas in that piece the private feelings were things you'd never say that were very personal uh, maybe relationship driven or uh, uh, sadness driven or anger in a in a old friendship that fell apart this feels like a kind of political rage coming through but it's not you in the photographs that we're seeing, meaning flesh and blood you. It's this iteration uh, of the viral you. And so I'm wondering if you, and I'd love to hear from Pinar as well, um, would like to speak about rage as an aspect of intimacy, as an aspect of private feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, let's see. I think that... Um there's a sense of anger right now in our political climate that um, you really can't hold on to all the time. Um, and there needs to be a way to put it out there. And um, I think that's what, what these Trishes are able to do in a way that because of my own personality, I don't, um, I don't, express that very often in my daily life. So it's nice to be able to have like a substitute who can be angry for you and perhaps take risks that you wouldn't take mm -hmm. and, um, and, and really sort of perform something. And, and in a way, yeah, I don't think of the Trishas as being me anymore once they have the sign and once they're on a sidewalk and in front of a bank, I think, oh, yeah, go get them. Like you guys are doing great, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and in in some ways, they have more permission to act out uh, than I even give myself. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like an interesting trick because they're really radical. Yeah, they and are more radical uh, than I am. <laughs> a lot of, but they are you. Yeah. Right? And so it's it's this interesting kind of echo of your own radical position. Yeah. Uh, and yet, because they're little, mm -hmm. but there's so many of them, they kind of meet you. Where, where you are, and they kind of surprise, it seems like they surprise you a little bit with mm -hmm. how radical they are, and yet you don't disagree with them, right? And I mean, you're on yes. the same page. And there is something about them being so small yeah. that um, <laughs> it, it was actually funny because with the Things I Never Say piece, whenever I watched those videos, they were just webcam videos. And so I kind of thought, well, they're too small because they're just, you know, little tiny webcam videos. You can't do anything with that, you know. They're too small. And, and so here I, I purposely made something that was very small and diminutive and um, couldn't possibly do anything on her own, you know. And so, and really then needed a group, a group to act with in order to make an impact. Yeah. Pinar, I wonder if you have thoughts. Well, I was going to ask. I just want to ask yeah. Trish, um, uh, so size, it, what you're saying that you were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so a, a lot of the size um, was more of a, a practical matter of just what the maker bot could produce <laughs> at a time. Um, and 
this amazing thing happened where uh, Justin, who was kind of in charge of operating the the printer, um, was just ready to print and print and print and print and 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 he wasn't ever going to stop. So I I had gotten to a point where I had a whole bunch of these little figurines and I was like, they're painted, they have signs, they're ready to go take photographs. And then Frank was like, well, don't you know, we've got a whole table full of Trishas just (laughs) waiting for you. And I was like, oh, (laughs) he's just going to keep printing them. (laughs) It was such a, it was kind of this great moment. Like, um, he's very likely still printing them, like now. (laughs) So I guess I was wondering, like, how many Trishas are enough for you to Mm -hmm. express or outsource the anger? <laughs> right. Is there a specific number? And like, okay, this is enough rage for Trump. Now mm-hmm. we're gonna allocate this mo- many more for you know whatever next thing you're protesting. Uh, oh, that's a great idea. So this this time around, I think Trump gets a hundred of them. A um, okay. And I I have some in reserve just in case something happens in the next two months. I can go ahead and produce those Trishas. Um, but I, I do think of this uh, show as something that can evolve and can continue, and it's not necessarily finished uh, today and then I walk away from it as a project. Mm-hmm. I really, I feel like there is more, <laughs> mm-hmm. more to say and uh, more to do, and um, we're going to have um, certainly more to follow in politics for the next year, mm-hmm. and... Um, and it's kind of a nice place to be as an artist to know that you have a statement to make and um, you can keep working on it and keep developing it um, and that it's not necessarily over onto the next thing tomorrow. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think one of, if you look at the, the, the protest signs, I spent some time just reading the, the, the protest signs of all of what the Trishas are saying and... One of the things that struck me was that while certainly you're, you're, you're placing this work in the context of the current political climate, mm-hmm. but they would be just as suitable, that, that, that they aren't dated in that way. Like the, the things that the Trishas are upset about and what they're calling for mm-hmm. is not specific to 2017 or 2018, but could be applicable in 1976 or 2040 because it's kind of touching on a more fundamental institutional or structural um, hegemony that you're fighting up against. You're talking about the government, not the Trump administration, right. the police, not a specific police department, or mm-hmm. the banks. And so that there's a way in which you're sort of looking at these institutions that are s- sites for political anger or personal anger, but they aren't quite so, con- they're not so tied to the election in the work that they require us to be thinking about the Trump all the time, that this work could live in a 10 more years and we might think about whatever we're mad about then and think, right, and we need to burn it all to the ground, just like your Trish says uh-huh. that we need to yeah. do, you know? And I think that's a real, that's, that was a touch I thought was really interesting, that I could be as angry as I am now with your Trishes, but that I could be, <laughs> that a younger me or an older me could also be angry with them because it's kind of the same system that your Trishas are angry about, which I think mm-hmm. is really interesting, so, which speaks, I think, to how many there could be. Yeah. Because if there is more, there's certainly more to address. Yeah, there was, um, there was a moment, um, you know, I do a lot of thinking on my drive home, as I'm sure a lot of us do, and I was thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if instead of just having these sort of Facebook slogans, because I started off thinking that, you know, they're going to protest, you know, hashtag no dapple and all these things, which was current at the time. I was like, well, what if they just had lines of poetry? And um, I was reminded of a poem that I grew up with and had been hanging in the powder room. And um, it was this, It was this poem that had been there, you know, all through my childhood and that I had memorized as a result by heart. And it's it's the one that says, uh, peacemaking is hard, hard almost is war, the difference being one you can stake life upon and limb and thought and love. And it, it kind of has a sort of deep 
resonance in me. And I thought, well, that would be a great protest slogan. Um, maybe I should look that up, see who wrote it. And well, it was Daniel Bear again, and that's a it's a writer that's near and dear to my family. Um, who I should mention are all here and also all know that poem by heart because they raised me to believe those values. And I thought, well, these are these are core values that um, we have and have lost track of. I think um, as a country, we can't take for granted that everybody shares them. Um, and it's it's really time to stand up and say what you do believe in because... Um, Otherwise, perhaps no one will know. And I just want there to be a record that the artists did protest in this scary time and that we do have beliefs and, um, and, and that we just, we, we want it to be known. <laughs> um, Michael, if, please. Okay, well, I was just going to um, continue with uh, your comment on rage as an aspect of intimacy. And I, when I, you know... Um, enter the exhibition space and like looking at the little trishes you call them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the protesting trishes and uh, the uh, game I just felt very calm so there's nothing to uh, let's say um, they're, they're not frustrating there is no like obvious exp expression of anger right um, so I just want to hear more about like this rage versus tranquility and, you know, choosing a much more soothing, let's say, um, um, stimuli to talk about these political issues mm -hmm. that actually make us very upset on a daily basis. So there's a contrast yeah. there, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that soothing quality comes from the game, mm -hmm. which is kind of built as a fantasy world or an escape, you know, hatch, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of, uh, it is kind of a desire for something other, for some other reality where, um, you know, the water is clean and the, the trees are green, right? It's kind of this beautiful game world uh, that the Trish can escape to when, when, when you play the game. Um, and I think part of that is, is sort of that desire for something more soothing and more tranquil mm -hmm. um, that, that isn't necessarily our reality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of the utopia of, of mm -hmm. speculative fiction, even, the yeah. science fiction utopia, that, that going into a dream or to the surrealist, painted, astral world that you've made is a kind of, it allows us to fantasize about another way, another, another possibility. When I was, I wrote the music for the game, and when we talked about what you wanted, I asked you, do you want natural sounds? And you said no. And I said, do you want instruments? And you said no. Which doesn't leave me with very much <laughs> if I don't have instruments or natural sounds. And we talked a little more, and you said, I want it to be like a dream. And... You know, we oftentimes think of the dream as being either the nightmare, so scary and intense, or the dream as being a kind of uh, surrealist David Lynch space, right? Where, where uncanny things happen that you can't explain, and you show up in front of people with no clothes on and that kind of stuff, right? Where you're embarrassed. And so we, we talked a little bit, and when I was working on the music, I really wanted to think about the dream as a kind of sensation like tranquility, that the sense mm -hmm. of being in, a, in another place that you can't quite put your finger on, but it feels like the past. And what I was interested to hear from you and, I, and, and Pinar, because it connects to this idea of what's possible beyond our ability to perceive, meaning speculative fiction, and what, what else is possible. Um, and you're using 3D printing, and you're doing virtual reality, you're thinking about the network and the virus of the body, is how do you see this revolutionary impulse connect to this notion of the dream or the impossible place? That's really nice. I think, um, I feel like there must, some change must happen that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I found some solace, can I mention the, 
novel in yeah. this in this <laughs> I, <can't. laughs> I found some solace in this novel I was reading um while I was working on the show actually and it's a Cory Doctorow novel called Walk Away uh, where his his characters go through these incredible transformations and the world goes through these incredible transformations um so that it becomes possible to create your own sim and download uh, your personality into it so that then there are then many copies of you and it doesn't ever matter if harm comes to any of them because there's always another one that can be made and so the world kind of keeps going in this way and they end up inventing this whole other uh, virtual world to live in and have relationships in and and it was really kind of this this amazing story. And in fact, it was so amazing that I asked him to come give a reading. And he's going to be here February 9th. <laughs> um, and I encourage everyone to come back then and hear what he has to say um, from a computer science and creative writing perspective. Um, because I, I think it is important that we learn to imagine and practice imagining alternate possibilities as a culture. And um, certainly for ourselves on an individual level. You know, your work deals with the post-human, right? And yes. the, the idea of, you know, uh, aqu aquatic life that can adapt to the toxins or the pollutants or the environment mm -hmm. in ways that are speculative and fantasy-driven, but also hyper connected to their biology and, mm -hmm. and I think really interesting ways. Spinar had a show at this gallery a few months ago called Air, The Ecosystem of Excess. And I'm wondering um, if I can ask you to speak to that, that idea of the, the speculative embodiment, whereas Trish is making dozens mm -hmm. or hundreds of miniatures of her own body as a revolutionary. Right. How, how do you think about these in conversation or this notion of the post-human? Ah, uh, so... Um, well, for, for my work, the ecosystem of excess is a fictitious ecosystem, which is kind of actually happening right now in the Pacific Ocean. And there are multiple parallels. One is I also started that project with a certain type of rage, mm -hmm. right? But uh, we tend to, in our culture, kind of simplify our, the complexity of our emotions in that, um, for instance, there is like some... Uh, very famous emotion theories that a lot of computer scientists are using right now to capture our emotional, you know, uh, status, uh, which categorizes emotions into uh, six main uh, categories, like fear, uh, joy, what was the other one, shock, uh, I'm forgetting the other three. But um, in fact, the more people look into this, like there is uh, so many different, the more scientists look into our emotions, there's so many different, uh, you know, combinations such as like rage and peace mm. together. And I experienced something like that when I found out about the Pacific trash vortex and all the sea life that's been negatively impacted by that. So my, uh, I guess, I would now using uh, you know, uh, Trisha's terminology, dreamscape was um, this new ecosystem where uh, all uh, life forms could actually ingest, digest, and metabolize plastic. So we wouldn't have to worry about turtles getting, you know, choked on eating plastic bottles. We wouldn't have to worry about dolphins beaching out because their entire digestive tract is filled with uh, some uh, greenhouse uh, plastic sheet. We wouldn't have to worry about you know, using plastic straws or plastic bags or pretty much everything in our life yeah. that's plastic, which is 99% of things that we currently touch and inhale and eat. So uh, that was tough and it was enraging and I felt very, um, I don't know, upset, uh, especially after seeing uh, Chris Jordan's uh, work on uh, the lazen albatross feeding their chicks with plastic ca bottle caps and the chicks Normally, albatross lives up to 60 or sometimes, uh, you know, 80 years old, but these chicks were dying because they couldn't, uh, you know, digest. So I was like, okay, I'm going to think about birds which have a new digestive tract so that they can, you know, uh, make microplastics. And I'm going to think about a kidney that can deal with this microplastics. I'm going to think about 
a stomach, which I call stomaximus, mm -hmm. which can, you know, um, deal with up to different types of uh, commercial industrial plastics. And then there will be this uh, beautiful ecosystem brimming with life that feeds off of plastics. So that was, I think, uh, my way of, you know, dealing with this rage, uh, rage using, again, um, a much more peaceful methodology. Yeah. So I see this as more like an artistic uh, method, in mm -hmm. a way, mm -hmm. right? Um, how do you cope with uh, something as grave and as enraging as that without literally going out in the streets? And I started thinking of this as dormant activism. Uh -huh. So I think what you're doing is uh, could be considered dormant activism too. It's not like we're out in the streets. My father was a member of the 68th generation and spent probably three years of his life just like on the streets organizing, you know, social movement, etc. in Europe and spent some of it in jail, etc. So I, I knew about this and I was like, we need probably something else, which is um, offering different cultural narratives than the mainstream narrative yeah. to cope with all these, you know, uh, loaded thoughts and emotions. So that was one thing, one parallelism that we see. The other thing is uh, making tangible objects. Right. So you do have a game too. <laughs> and maybe I should make an ecosystem of excess game myself so that you can like swim with the fish and like <laughs> look at different types of plastics or something. Enjoy your um, plastic. The yeah, they can, they can like uh, churn whatever plastic waste is going out there. Uh, but uh, I do think there is an intrinsic power of uh, placing an object with symbolic value in front of the audience. Mm -hmm. So you walk around it, it's in your personal space, you know you can touch it. It's more um, multimodal in a way. So I'm, I'm a firm believer of this, that's why I always end up you know, making physical manifestations of my mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. So I thought like having these uh, little trishes with the protest, you kind of just want to like look at every single one. So there's more uh, to offer uh, to the audience in terms of the cognitive load of the work. But it's not a film either, which means with the film, for instance, you have to start, continue, stop, so you're kind of stuck with the timeline. But when it's an object, you give the viewer the, old, the, the space, the room, right, to explore on their own. I think it speaks to this kind of like childlike curiosity that we all possess and some, somewhat lose because we're all busy, etc. cetera. So um, that's what I thought was there too with this work. Um, yeah, I'll end here. No, that's, that's, <laughs> fine. That's, really, that's really great. Trish, I wonder if, if you have thoughts connected to, to that as well with Pinar's work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, there's, so, there's so much in common, and um, I see lots of room there for discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things is something I've been thinking about lately and been in conversation with is um, this question of uh, anger and anxiety has a relationship with grief and depression mm -hmm. and um some of the antidote to that as we know is medical um but some of the antidote to that is uh power and so how individuals can can kind of create their own totem or just in sort of uh re-establish their own power that they may have as individuals mm. is kind of an interesting way to think about it. Um, and it's, I don't know if it's, if it's off topic or exactly on topic, but it, it's certainly related. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned this earlier uh, when you were introducing the work, you use the term powerless, right? Yeah. But there's something empowering about actually doing, uh, I don't know, an art piece right. around the things that piss you off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like there is something liberating mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. And liberating for us to see. I mean, I think that there's a value for us as an audience and as collaborators and colleagues to be able to, to see uh, this, this thing that you mentioned, Pinar, about the object uh, mm -hmm. being present. 
that we're not kind of watching a movie about these protests. We're not just looking at pictures, and I think the pictures are fantastic because they show us these trishes in context yeah. in the real world. But then when they're there with us in the space, we're with them, right? Mm -hmm. So they're protesting 24 seven, like yeah. you said, but we get to kind of, it's a generosity that we get to then embrace that spirit of solidarity with the hundred trishes that we may not have felt before we entered the space. And we may not feel looking at a photo, which is a kind of document, a temporal document, whereas these are infinite. And in their infinite protest, they invite me as a viewer, or they invite, and when I leave, I know that they're there. And that continuity of their, of their power is something that I can then, as a, as a visitor, um, borrow. I can, it, it, I can leverage my own power right. along with them in real time. And I, I found them very humorous, so there's an obvious sense of humor, <coughs> right? Sure, yeah. I was wondering, Trish, are you thinking of making a, like marching protest bots or <laughs> yeah. drones that you know carry signs and drop down on, I don't know, mm -hmm. our students or whatever <laughs> yes. on campus? Like, what is the next phase for this? Yeah, yeah there, is, there is definitely a next phase. It involves uh, mobility, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was imagining that eventually they would have little platforms with wheels so they could wheel around <laughs> on a flat surface, at possibly a sidewalk. And then um, also that in their little pedestals, so now their pedestals are relatively high, um, would also, they would have their own little Wi-Fi connectivity, you know. Mm -hmm. So then... Because ultimately, what I really want is for them to be able to communicate with each other, and um, and you know, talk to each other, uh -huh. um, and be able to share their experiences and check in, and um, that that is all in you know the next phase. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't quite achieve all of that today, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course it's a, a process. But were you think? Are you thinking of like using? custom screens or something so that the protests can be updated by you. Oh, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's evil. <laughs> yeah, could be more expensive than uh -huh. a regular protest sign, of course, but. <laughs> so I wonder if we can get some questions from the audience and uh, see what all of you might have to ask. Yes, please. Hi, Trish. Hi. Um, my question is, what is the metaphor and why did you pick network error? Mm -hmm. title. Um, well, that is the error message I get whenever I try to post to Facebook and the Wi-Fi won't let me. And it's, but it's also a very common um, technical error whenever you're doing computing and the network won't let you. Um, and, and I thought, well, this, this sense of an error message is something that protesters are actually um, doing. So they're saying there is something wrong with society. We're not sure what it is, but we're telling you there's a problem, right? And so they're, I'm, I'm trying to have them function the same way as these little horrible messages that we get. <laughs> Oh, um, we're really sure what it is. It's the network. Well, you know, or whatever. Yeah. You know, right? Some of those are very specific. It's very interesting. Some it's of us are <laughs> sure yeah. what the problem is. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, among your uh, among your trishes, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. but it, you know, it could be taken a couple different ways, and the more positive way to take it would be that, um, you know, in community we could achieve something greater. Someone else. I'm not. I'm sorry if I'm not. Oh yeah, right. please. I didn't realize we had mics. There's mic there, and there's a mic there. Hi, Trish. Hi. And hi, Michael. And hi, Pinar. Um, all dear colleagues um, working in the same department. So I, I think maybe I'm, I have a. I'm going to ask a little one of the tougher questions because we're friends, and, and it's a it's a friendly tougher question. Um, but first, I want to say how much I like the work. Uh, it, you know, it, it, I mean, I, I really, really love the work, and it's really—I I was really struck by that transformation from things I never say to this piece, from that that moment of individual protest to uh, a, a virtual version of a, a 
fantasy of collective protest made of Trish. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most certainly, you know, if we can, if we can make that kind of collective safety happy and ha that kind of collective safety happen and, you know, have, have Trish save the world, I'm, I'm totally into that. <laughs> I'm signing up, let, you know, let, let's go. But you know, it, it emerges, so we have, we have on, you know, individuality and collectivism, which is a, a question in the sort of transformation between the two pieces. I mean, it, it's a little trite to, to reference the particular work, but I was thinking a little bit of Battleship Potemkin, too, mm -hmm. that, that moment from the hero as an individual um, to, or, you know, or the, or the person maybe suffering behind the webcam as an individual, to a kind of collective suffering uh, mm -hmm. behind the webcam, which, which is evident in this piece. Mm -hmm. and, and the little bit, the harder question then is, you know, uh, making that transformation from kind of uh, the gallery to a non-virtual, tangible collectivism. Um, I, I maybe have the opposite point of view about virtuality, that it's not so wonderful to walk into the painting, mm -hmm. but in, in fact, we should be going the other way right now. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how in, in the next work that you're planning, um, you know, you maybe, you know, engage things in a way that, that aren't bound by the limits of expression and representation within the gallery. Mm -hmm. Well, that I think suggests going more in the direction of, of taking these further into the streets, you know. Um, just for practical purposes, all the photos that we're showing here are just done in San Diego, you know. Um, but it could certainly, <laughs> they could certainly move further, um, and they could certainly be joined by others. And um, I'm down. I'm down with that. Getting further into the streets, getting outside of the San Diego region, you know, cr possibly crossing the border. You know, they can learn Spanish, no problem. <laughs> They don't need water either, so. Yeah, they can go protect the water stations and be allies there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone else? Questions? And if you don't want to get up, you can just yell it too. <laughs> oh, hi. So, so this is kind of related to, you, you said something about um, how we need to imagine something that we haven't tried yet. So when I walked into the gallery, and I, I love the game, but I also love the figures, and I wanted to pick them up and play with them. Mm -hmm. And at some point, Randy, Trisha's brother, made the comment, ah, she's finally embraced the toy soldiers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there was a lot of toy soldiers and a lot of chess playing in their household growing up. And, but it occurred to me, these are not toy soldiers. Yeah. These are protesters with a peace message. Yeah. And, you know... So I, I, I'm, I'm pulling those uh, disparate ideas together in my mind that, you know, the Berrigan quote is a peacemaking quote. Mm -hmm. And so often when, it, when we are enraged, what do we do with it? We lash out, we shame, we blame. Mm -hmm. These little guys, little girls, are speaking out. They are, they are not passive, but they are peacemaking. Mm -hmm. I thought that was fascinating. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, I'm sure my mom knows and doesn't want to embarrass me by bringing up my childhood um, that was filled with Barbie dolls. None of them had a political inkling at all in, in their little plastic. Your mom's actually presenting at seven. Body. Yeah, yeah, she'll. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but there's definitely a, a sense of play that you have as a kid um, that is nostalgic to return to as an adult. And it is an imagination space, for sure. And I think you want to, perhaps that kind of play allows the brain to do things that it wouldn't otherwise do, you know? One, one thing that I really loved about the presentation was the sense of irony. Mm. And the, 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 the protester was, was stands there saying, we were promised Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> and the, um, 
the protester who says, too small to fail. Uh -huh. And I think that's just, that's just wonderful. So being here in UCSD, I had to uh, turn, turn to thinking about Dr. Seuss. Mm -hmm. And so in, this, in the spirit of irony, I was thinking about all the little cats, yeah. right? <laughs> and wondering whether any of the little cats is a little cat Z who has some vavoom under the hat and <laughs> what, it, what it perhaps is going to offer. <laughs> I guess we'll have to find out that one. <laughs> Any other questions or observations from anybody? Please. <laughs> wow. Do you want to speak to how the work functions in the in the context of the the way in which women are now being more encouraged and heard when they speak in a political context? Um well there is certainly this wave of me too that is the latest um that has happened and it you know, I, I don't know anyone who hasn't <laughs> had a Me Too moment. Um, and, and that's the one thing that kind of surprises me in, in all these social media narratives is that um, it was ever taken for granted that these things were not happening. Um, but it's, it, what's more interesting to me about this particular slice is that it comes after so many other uh, shocks to the white liberal nation, um, which is that, oh, it turns out police are always abusive. Oh, it turns out that everyone is racist. Like, these things are only shocking if um, you haven't experienced it yourself. So, um, yeah, certainly they could, they could follow along in that train of thought and... Um, I'm sure that there will be others, right? Just mm -hmm. like a, in a couple more months, you know, we'll find out that, that there's a whole new kind of monster that we haven't even named yet. I almost want to end it at that, but it seems very dark. Um, but <laughs> yeah. It, uh, are there any more? I don't want to end before that. There, if anyone has a, another a final thought or question before we finish. Okay, well, thank you very much, Pinar and Trish. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Trish. Um, please join us in the lobby. There's a reception uh, with food and drink, and the show is up uh, for the evening, and the game can be played, and you can enjoy yourselves. And thank you very much for coming out.